We're all here for Jessica Halpin today. Um, she, oops, she's an artist, designer, and writer. Um, I've, I feel like I've somewhat like grown up just reading a lot of the, a lot of her work, a lot of her books. I know when I was in college, her essays just meant a lot to me, and and I still find myself rereading them and even going through some of her, some of her podcasts. So it's a great honor to have you here today, Jessica. Um, and just a little, a little reminder that Jessica, she will be talking about her book um, today. And this is her book, Self-Reliance. I highly recommend it. I have my copy here. Great book, uh, 12 wonderful essays. So I have available on Amazon and a lot of the major uh, book retailers. At the end of the talk, we are gonna be doing a raffle. So if you stick around at the end, we're gonna be calling one person at random and collecting your information, and then you'll be receiving a, a autographed copy of the book. So with that said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to hand it over to you, Jessica. Thank you, Christian, and thank you all for coming. And I wish I was in Chicago, which I love, but in fact, I'm in a hotel room. Can you tell the lovely decor behind me? In Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, so. Um, Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm gonna talk for about 40 minutes, maybe a little less because I don't wanna keep you all from dinner. Um, and I'm gonna talk about three things. I'm gonna talk about writing briefly. I'm gonna talk about painting, which for me has become the most important work I'm doing and, and how painting comes out of graphic design for me. What, what, how, how my work and the body of work I'm building really is informed by a long career as a designer, although disclaimer, I don't really self identify as a graphic designer anymore. I sometimes say I'm a recovering designer. I have a lot of questions about what design has become about the ethics surrounding practice about the degree to which design can confer false authority on almost anything. And it's part of the reason I wrote self reliance, I'll end my talk with a brief video that's a conversation between myself and Jarrett Fuller, who's the other designer, the, my co-designer on the book. Ralph Waldo Emerson is my co-author, Jarrett Fuller is my co-designer, uh, that really talks about the choices we made typographically in the book because it has no illustrations, but it is an expression through type of the ideas in both Emerson's essay and mine. So with that being said, I am going to share my screen we are gonna hope this works because we had some serious technical issues earlier. And working, yes, thumbs up, Lauren. Okay, Lauren's my friend. She's makes sure that I'm running on the, on the right track. Okay, so the reason this talk is called Evidence of Things Unseen is that I think that everything begins with observation. And design is observation, science is observation, being a good citizen is observation, being a good reader is observation. And in my case, the way I look at the world in, in many ways happens through writing. I kind of see myself as someone who pivots between the visual world and the written world. And I write like an artist and I paint like a writer and design is for me somewhere in between. I started by writing very short essays 25 years ago about what we then called new media, which is in many ways what I'm talking to you on now, computers and screens and the degree to which we were looking suddenly as graphic designers no longer through the lens of paper, but through a variety of other screens. So my first book was self-published. It was six essays. My second book was an essay on Paul Rand, who you all know, of course, it was my thesis advisor in graduate school. This was an essay I wrote about him as a practitioner in tandem with an essay about him as an educator and how they informed one another. One of the essays was actually published in the New Republic, which is an odd place to read about a designer. And my editor said to me when I wrote the essay, begin at the beginning and explain what design is to an audience of extremely intelligent people who haven't a clue what it is you do for a living. And that, in a sense, is what designers do all the time, right? We explain, we make clear, we adjudicate for our clients, we clarify for our clients. And Rand was, of course, an exceptional thinker and mathematician in many ways, and someone who really thought about form and content in all kinds of innovative ways, long before we talked about innovation. 
My third book was a book of essays called Screen. This was a compilation of essays that I wrote over a number of years for I Magazine in London. Again, looking at the screen as a lens, as a platform, as a stage, as a filter, thinking about all the different screens that circumscribe and circumvent our world. My fourth book grew out of a collection I had. I come from a family of collectors and historians, and my first collection of, of any size was a collection of circular charts, but also movable charts. And these originated in the Middle Ages and were made without algorithms or made without computers. And I was fascinated by how they had no right angles, uh, mostly, and how they had to be designed by someone almost like a landscape designer would think of a bloom cycle, imagining how you would turn something and end up with something when you couldn't see it at the beginning. So the, the idea that you were designing in time and in space, but without a computer. It was published by Princeton in 2002. In 2008, this book came out the day Obama was elected. That's my grandmother, Minnie, on the cover when she was 22. On the upper right is the motel room key from the night the poet Anne Sexton eloped at the age of 19. I found that in her scrapbook at the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas at Austin. And none of the Sexton scholars thought looking at her scrapbook was important because they were looking at her poetry. Well, guess what? She was 19, she eloped, and she was writing dumb little poems next to recipes she was saving so she knew how to cook for her husband because she was so young and didn't know how to do anything. Poetry began in fits and starts in the pages of her scrapbook the same way our ideas begin in fits and starts in the pages of our sketchbooks. Scrapbooks to me were then, as now, a really fascinating public medium. Men kept scrapbooks. People who had no money would keep scrapbooks on tops of the pages of things like phone books and textbooks. It was not Martha Stewart back in the 19th and early 20th century. It was a really rich, incredible visual vernacular, and that's why I wanted to trace it. It was a very hard book to write because I had to just, it was like a needle in a haystack. I just had to look and find these things and try to tease out and excavate stories. And what I think I was really touched by was that they were made by people who were not like us. And here I'm talking about most of you here, I think are visual makers and form givers, but they were people who felt compelled for what ever reason to keep these remarkably visual records of their lives and they're in libraries and they fall apart and they end up on ebay and so there's a kind of fragility to them and a tenderness to them and a vulnerability to them and one other thing i'll say is that people tend to keep journals and scrapbooks in times of strife so after 9 11 surge in scrapbooks civil war surge in scrapbooks pandemic surge in scrapbooks so that's what this book was about. Um, and it's a sort of strange size um, and it's filled with illustrations. Uh, and I only uh, limited it to American scrapbooks because if I had included anything else in Europe or other continents, I would still be writing this book. In 2016, I published a book on design as a humanist discipline. These were a series of essays I wrote about things like design and humility and design and honesty and design and sadness. The idea that design isn't just about making things shiny and new, but that we really are consumers of visual things, but we're also makers of visual things. And both at both ends, we're people first. So I think this is a really important uh, conversation that needs to be had more, which is that we need to maybe dig a little deeper and look a little harder and ask more penetratingly difficult questions of ourselves and each other when we make things. And this was the first time I combined my writing with my painting. So the book is illustrated. You can see a little bit on the cover behind the pink part. You can see that it, it's actually a, a painting of a teased nerve. And what is teasing the nerves but design? You're actually trying to get someone to have a reaction. So I did all this research on biology and the paintings are histological tissue specimens where I'm looking at things like a heart ventricle or the, the sheath that wraps around a nerve or something in the, um, in, this, in the brain that's a synapse that maybe is close to where the eye is looking and judging and making decisions. And this is important because what I'm gonna talk about now is the work I'm making and the biases we bring to that work. Uh, very briefly, Michael Beirut and I did a compendium of 15 years of design observers writing that came out 
uh, by MIT Press, published it in 2019, I'm sorry, in 2018, and in 2019, this book came out. And this was the turning point for me. It's a book about the face. It's organized in 26 chapters, A through Z. It was a bear to write. I will never write a book like this again. But I've always been obsessed with portraits and uh, with faces and with uh, likenesses and with bias and with eugenics and with how facial measurement and all kinds of measurement. I mean, designers make things all the time, ID cards, passports, all of these containers of our identity in which our faces are displayed and delivered sometimes against our will. The rules, for example, about passport ID picture is fascinating if you're someone who has a headdress or has facial hair and this is part of your culture and you are told at passport control that you actually can't show yourself this way. That's what interested me. That's why I wrote the book. And then finally, Self-Reliance, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end because it's a very, very different book from Face. Okay, here we go. Part two, paintings. Face came out in 2019, and right after it came out, I went to Italy for six weeks on a painting fellowship. And I took the book with me, and I looked at some of the images in the book, and I started to think to myself, there's something in these photographs that really compels me. And what if I start, as I always do, I always start with photographs, what if I work on top of a photograph, and I try, just like a designer tries to isolate, clarify, the most salient and germane part of something in order to, for example, come up with a logo. I started to look at these images and think, what happens if I try to go in deeper and isolate and identify and clarify these faces? And these two faces that are in the book are part of a collection of 15,000 negatives that have never been seen, that are at the Yale School of Medicine, that are images of people who had uh, brain abnormalities, in many cases, brain tumors. And Harvey Cushing, who's the father of neurosurgery, took photographs of them, before and after photographs. If any of you know, are familiar with the work of August Sander, the 19th century German photographer, they are August Sander-like in their precision. And I started to look at these images and I thought, this is what I want to work with. So here is an example of what these images look like. They are small, they are negatives, they're between 10, I think, and 15,000, 2,000 of them have been cataloged. People were asked to hold their hands up because in many cases, a pituitary abnormality led to an overgrowth in a part of the body. So the hand would show relative scale to say a shoulder or, at, or, or um, the thickness of a neck or an oversized ear, for example. So when you look at these people's faces, you can say the haircut, the posture, the uh, bathrobe is something of a different century. But you can also look at them and say, these are universal expressions. And on some level, for me at least, I think that what makes a portrait fascinating is what lies between that which is universal and that which is unique. We all have faces, we all have noses, we all have mouths, we all have two eyes, we look for symmetry. I know from writing my book that Standards of beauty are actually classified around geometry more than anything else. We look for balance and harmony and symmetry, bilateral symmetry. I started to look at these paintings and this is what I did. So here is an example of the kind of sketch I would make. Again, going in and isolating all that's important. The hand, not important. The background, not important. The, um, the fact that his pants are the way they are, the fact that he has hair on his arms. I'm looking at the face. And so I'm just like you would with charcoal. I'm on top of the photograph, painting on top of the photograph to try to look at what it is I want to isolate. So then there are these questions that come up. And many of the questions that come up are ethical. Do I have the right to work with this material? There's something in uh, ethics called the medical gaze, the male gaze, the, the fact, the clinician's gaze. So here is a nurse holding the head of a macrocephalic child. This child, you can see that he has a misshapen skull. Well, if I crop the photograph and I remove the nurse and all you see are the hands cradling the face, it's a very different image. And you start to notice other details. For example, the fact that the shine in his irises is rectilinear, probably looking up at a clinical light, the way you have in the hospital, those long thin lights. And I started to realize that there were many, many questions I had. 
what happens when someone has a scar? Well, I got really interested in learning how to paint scars. And in each case, in this case, for those of you who know something about paint from art school, I painted this really thick, very impasto. I was interested in almost the globular form of the, like a globe like of this man's skull. It wasn't his facial expression, but I was interested in the geometry of how the incision met the circumference of his face. In other cases, I removed the scar. And by adding color to this man's face, you add a kind of humanity to them. Well, again, I'm having conversations throughout this process with bioethicists and brain surgeons and all kinds of people to say, why am I so drawn to this material? Now, what I haven't said and I need to add is that these paintings are enormous. They're one meter by a meter and a half, which is about 40 by 60 inches. My friend Paula Scher came to look at my paintings and she saw some big and some small. And she said, oh, no, no, you all know she wrote a book called Make It Bigger. She said, you have to make them big. And it's true that when you make them big, everything becomes resonant in a way that, that is impactful emotionally, which is exactly, I think, what I'm after. Not in a gratuitous way, not to slight these people in any way. But so, so it's a lot of examination, a lot of looking, a lot of close, careful looking, which, of course, that is what observation, good observation, scientific, careful scrutiny of your subject. That's what photographers do. That's what designers do. That's what scientists and journalists and astronauts do. And that's what I've been doing with these things. So again, what detail do I have to go on? I'm looking at this woman and I'm thinking, interesting hair. No, interesting cranial abnormality. What happens if I cut out the cranial abnormality? And then you just look at her amazing eyes. Then I ask myself the question, am I exoticizing these people? Am I aestheticizing these people? Is it my role to do this? And at some point I realized I just wanted to have the conversation. So here's this man, so handsome, right? Look at that face, beautiful, beautiful man. But you can tell there's something wrong. His face is out of whack. His mouth is out of whack. His posture is out of whack. And yet, if you let go of those things, you see the hair, you see other things about him. Now, I should say that this one was very, very early. And what happens is I got better. I got better at painting. I've put in my 10,000 hours. I'm actually kind of catching on to what I need to do now. For this painting, I probably have 125 versions. I lost a lot of time. I lost a lot of money. At some point, I wanted to capture the essence of this beautiful man looking up, sort of cocking his head away from the position of his shoulders. Again, I'm making editorial decisions like a designer. I'm making painterly decisions. I'm making decisions about color and tone and lighting source. Sometimes I'm painting people very light, almost like pastel. Sometimes I'm painting, painting them with a lot more layers of paint. And again, choosing to let go of some of the details of the ancillary part of the person lets you pay attention to things like the skin color or the shadow or the light source. Light source I'm going to come to in a moment. I think we tend to think of portraiture as something that is extremely specific and extremely um, cogent and cohesive. And I think designers by their nature, and I'm going to put myself in this camp right now, I think that we tend to uh, resist the ambiguous. We're not paid to be ambiguous. We're not paid to actually be wishy-washy. And yet what I found in these paintings was that there was something about softness and precision. There was something about cropping and openness. There was something about the scale of the background of removing ancillary detail and also bringing out the sort of luminous quality of the person, their character, their sadness, their ineffable sense of impending loss. In some cases, these people had just been told they were going to die. And yet you look at this man and, you know, if you didn't see the picture on the left on I hadn't told you this whole story, you might think he's a waiter in a restaurant in France in 1850. So I started getting really interested in looking at other artists. I was looking a lot at Caravaggio. I was looking a lot of John, of, at um, uh, John Singer Sargent. But at the end of the day, there's an entire process that's digital. I do all these studies on my iPad. I project, I print, I print on canvas, I paint over canvas. I'm always working on layers. My books are the same way. I never start with a blank canvas because I don't think the world is a blank canvas. There was always something there. And I'm interested in the transformative, evocative ways in which the things I make can become something else without eviscerating what they began as, right? So this is a really tricky thing. I sometimes feel I'm actually getting into character almost like a method actor. 
In this painting, these two little boys, the one on the right was the one I think who had the illness. And the one on the left was, I think, his brother and brought in for relative, I want to say norm normalcy, but some kind of contextual balance um, because the other boy's posture was completely askew. And so I cropped them because they're both naked. That's the other thing I'm making, like judgments about what is not so expository and exposed, but protected and, and in a sense, um, humane in, in, in paying homage to these images. Sometimes the sketches are very, very rough. You can see the, the very rough, that's the very first scan on the left. I did a very quick sketch on the right. Other times I'm playing with color that's not real. I'm just imagining blue light, the way examining rooms sometimes have blue light. And the beauty of working on an iPad is that I can isolate the layer. And this taught me a lot about illumination and lighting and crafting. My, the next phase of this work as I move into my new studio is I bought myself an actual camera, a real camera, and I'm gonna start shooting my own models and really having ownership of the form itself. But for now, because I'm a good collector and a good uh, harvester of things, uh, I've been working with these images. So this was the first body of work. It's called The Cushing Portraits and you can find it on my website. How are we doing on time? We good? Okay, all right, we're gonna keep moving. I came back from Italy and six months later, three months later, I had another fellowship. This time I was in California. Uh, for anyone who is either in California, been to California, the light in California is unbelievable. And there I was in beautiful sunny California, every East Coast person's dream. It's January, I left the East Coast, it was snowing sideways. I get to California, it's beautiful. Six weeks later, lockdown. So there I am. Lockdown, me and my television in my loft, walking in circles, writing the essays for self-reliance. And at night I would watch CNN. And these were my friends. And I started taking these really crappy pictures on my iPhone, playing with the aberrant discordant color palette of winter in Los Angeles. This sort of vibrant, weird backgrounds and not looking to color match and not looking for the fidelity. We, these people are, this is the, complete opposite of the Cushing portraits. These are people whose faces are on the screen all day long. And yet what I loved was I was shooting them in live mode. So when I got to the studio, I would have one picture of Fauci, it was 12 pictures of Fauci, and I could decide to get him as he was moving, out of focus with weird lighting. And again, these also very experimental, sometimes very sketchy. I mean, that is California lighting right there, right? He's sitting outside in Texas, I'm in California, he's on the screen, lights coming in behind me, it's at night, it's winter time. It's, this is why Diebenkorn painted the way he did. California has its completely own color palette. And I thought, I may be stuck inside, but the ambient light in my apartment can still actually help me make sense of the making of form in a new way. So it helped me actually pay attention to different kinds of faces, different kinds of lighting conditions, different kinds, you know, then things happen where Bill Gates is in the news and I painted him a year ago and oh, guess what, Bill Gates is in the news. And so you start to look at them differently because they're coming through a media circuitry that is different than was the day you thought you were capturing them in some benign way. This painting of um, Chris Cuomo, uh, I painted shortly before I painted his brother, shortly before his brother's problems began. And these two paintings possibly, possibly, are going to be in Chicago next year on exhibit in a, in a small exhibition at the Smart Museum. Uh, for those of you who speak Italian, the plural of, of O is I, so the, the two paintings together are equomi. Uh, and it's sort of amazing, they look alike and they don't look alike, um, but that was actually an incredible fun to do. Uh, and these paint and these also they are I'm showing you just the details, but these are scaled to the size of an average large TV. So they're like 30 by 40 inches, I think. So they feel and a lot of them are sort of backlit in blue. So you can see Anderson Cooper there, for example. I mean, it has a very sort of televised uh, look. So this was a kind of a little exercise I gave myself because I was writing during the day and I would sketch at night and then on the weekends I would make these paintings. So that's the second one. Now, I'm gonna show you what I'm doing now, which I'm so excited about, I can hardly sleep at night. I got very interested as I was harvesting these images from Cushing and as I was retrofitting my practice into those television images, I got very interested in 
a couple things. So here's what I learned, and I'm going to just do this really quick summary of what I've talked about so far that takes us into the new work. I learned I can do these color studies and really educate myself about all kinds of things about shading and the sculpture of the face. I've, I've been thinking I'd like to take these paintings and 3D print them and paint those. Like there's something about doing these studies very much using a digital medium. For me, it's all about pixel and pigment, pigment and pixel, back and forth, painting and sketching. I take a painting, I take a picture of it, I print it out, I paint on top of it. It's a very generative process. And this taught me this wonderful, uh, using the iPad, that you can isolate layers. I and mean, you could do it in Photoshop too. But for me, this was really uh, revelatory. Second thing is going big. Going big, go big or go home. You just have to do it. And, and you get to this point when you're working on something big where you don't even know what you're doing. And, and you are at one with that eye or that nose or that ear. And then you step back from it. And then in other, other cases, you're, I work with very long brushes. And so there's this incredible scale relationship. And after working on a laptop for 30 years doing graphic design, this is revelatory to me. The third thing is, don't think you know what you know. So I was always told I look like my mother. That's my father. OK? And this was important because when I wrote Face, I realized that we all have biases. Everybody has biases. You're told stories, you believe in narratives, you hold on to the things you think you know, you don't know. We all have biases. Here's where it comes back to graphic design. This is my studio in Italy. I'm in Italy, in Liguria, facing the sea with a tiny little studio, but I had a wall. And the only way I could see these things at scale was to print them in A4. And so then I would tile them. And I thought, you know what? That's sequencing, that's editorial design. That's what I did for many years when I designed books and magazines. And I started making books of the tiled images. And I started thinking about mapping juxtapositions and about decontextualizing things. Something, the thing on the bottom is continuous, the thing in the middle is not. What is a finger? What is a nose? What is light? What is shadow? What is near? What is far? All of these questions back and forth and back and forth through the generative nature of the practice. And then it hit me. So remember this woman? I thought to myself, what would happen if instead of using a neural network, an algorithm generated thing to make a fake person, what if I built my own fake person? So I started with her because her posture intrigued me. And I ended up with this. So you can see where there was a 19th century dress. I rebuilt her collarbone, her neck, the lighting, the hair, her mouth, if you looked at those things in an album, you might think these people are related. The person in that painting, again, giant, a meter by a meter and a half, does not exist. This person does not exist. If the first image showed me that by combining features of totally non-contiguous people, what happens is, and if I go back, can I go back? No, I'll go back for a second. One of the things that happens with this woman for me is that she becomes androgynous. It's not clear that she's male, female, trans, she's beautiful, the hair, not clear, short, modern, not modern, 19th century dress, 21st century hair. There's a little bit of a sort of incongruity to this that I find compelling. So what happens when that incongruity becomes racial? This child has blonde hair, but the skin is slightly dark. The lips say maybe he's African-American, but the eyes are blue. Does it make you uncomfortable not knowing? He's beautiful. By what standards is he beautiful? Because of symmetry, because he has whatever, his eyes are blue. And the expression, the universal expression, again, this person does not exist. Third one, the eyes on this person are from an African-American man toned down because when I started looking at those eyes, it looked like he had a black eye. He had a black eye because the person was black, not because he'd been punched, right? So I'm starting to look at like face 101, eyes, nose, mouth. What happens when you combine these things? And for each one of these things I'm showing you, I have hundreds of collages and I'm doing them the old fashioned way. I'm collaging them, drawing them, weaving them, painting them, editing them. I, I, I'm obsessed with this, right? And so I, what I think is interesting is it'd be really easy to do this through an algorithm, but that's kind of not the point. It's like when you were in art school and your 
teachers sent to you, you got to print stuff out. I don't just want to see it on your laptop. It's the same thing. You have to make it and I make it big and the mistakes are big and the discoveries are big and the whole thing is amazing. So if this person has eyes of an African American person where the skin color may not match and the hair may not match a man or a woman, I really, that's not really, this thing is for me, it's all about the eyes. This one, which I'm currently in doing right now, which is why there's a little bit of a problem around the eyes where I haven't quite figured out where the wrinkles are going. That's 20 different people's eyes around the eye, but the eye itself is an elderly Caucasian man, but he looks Asian because in concert with the face down below, which is of a woman, the eye reconciles that discomforting mashup by thinking he's Asian. Also, before I chopped off the very top of his head, totally thought it was a woman. So I'm not young. I've been, I've been making images my whole life. Like these things surprise me all the time. And I find it so fascinating because what I learned in writing my book, and I've said it before, I can't say it enough, is that you think you know, and you do not know. We think we know faces. We think we know our own faces. You do not know, right? And I just think that's, it's not graphic design. So I apologize to you graphic designers who may have come thinking I was going to talk about fonts. I'm going to talk about fonts in a moment. But for me, this level of scrutiny and observation and discovery and humility around bias keeps me up at night in, in the best way, the best way. Okay. Last piece of my talk, Self-Reliance came out May 18th in the US by Thames and Hudson, distributed by Norton. We're delighted that we're gonna be giving a book away. Here it is. Uh, rather than explain it, because you've been listening to me uh, droning on about my paintings for so long, I thought you uh, might like to hear it from Jarrett Fuller and myself. This is a video we made for a lecture series at Central St. Martin's in London last month. Uh, in which we were asked to explain why we did what we did. And it'll give you a little bit of a sneak preview of what's in the book. So if you stuck around this long, you can enter your name in the raffle and win one. And if you don't win one, I hope you'll go buy one. They're not expensive. Uh, okay, so here goes. Let's hope this works. Envy is ignorance. Imitation is suicide. to be misunderstood. Pythagoras was misunderstood. And Socrates and Jesus and Luke. I wrote this book that we designed together on the subject of self-reliance when I was not only away from my teaching duties, because uh, uh -huh. I was in lockdown in Los Angeles, but I was away from my children. And I started to think about children everywhere and I started to think about students everywhere and I wanted to write a book for them inspired by this marvelous essay written by Ralph Waldo Emerson, white male privileged 19th century philosopher whose works are epic. But uh, I think in this particular instance, this essay really resonated with me and, and with you, I think. What was it about that essay that you felt was applicable to this moment, despite all of those cultural differences? I think in a world where consensus is such a strong driving force in industry, in the economy, on creative teams, I thought it's high time we turn to someone for whom consensus was actually evil. It, it's funny that we take this essay that's over 100 years old and design it in such a modern, you know, a modern way. And the typefaces themselves, I think it's important to note, have special meaning in the text and in your history and in, in our history. So the main book, the book of, of Emerson's text is set in a typeface called Emerson. Right. And then your essays and your kind of commentary and responses are set in Nuhas Unica, which I guess is like the official design of the typeface. Correct. I wrote this book and we designed this book in a year of incredible social tumult mm -hmm. where questions of what is accessible and what is legible and legibility, not just in terms of typography, but cultural legibility, yeah. right? Yeah. But I think interpretation of what an American, the resonance of an American mm -hmm. individualist voice land differently for European readers. And so being conscious of that, again, at a moment when we're, you know, we're watching the George Floyd world 
right. unfurl in unprecedented ways. It makes you think about the choice of a typeface in a way that's completely different. What does access really mean? What does inclusivity really mean? But to come back to the, the crisis of the individual, I mean, there's no more pertinent essay, I think, than this one to really stop and yeah. think about what, what the world means to you. There's something very contemporary, very 21st century in the construction of the book itself, in that you can read his entire essay all the way through in the first part of the book. But we broke it up through these big kind of illustrative block quotes, but then also previewed your essays that appear at the end, which you could almost think of as kind of extended footnotes. You know, the fact that we have the main text in justified type, which mm -hmm. um, most people don't like to do. It feels like a very 19th century thing to do. My essays, which are all appear at the end of the book, are all aligned on the baseline, which is like um, setting something flush, flush right, <laughs> rag left. But I thought if he was grounded in the column that was a justified type, then my essays could be grounded by being anchored to the bottom of the page. Many moving parts, and yet the logic of it really, I think, became clear to us as we went through, um, the more we actually isolated these dimensions. And this brings us to the topic of the, of the end papers. If this is a book of contrast of old and new, 19th century, 21st century, serif, sans serif, black, white, this is probably the biggest contrast in the entire book. Then visually also, we took the letter I from both typefaces, Emerson and Newhouse Unica. So I think it also speaks a little bit to the cover. We went through many drafts of the color. I think this was in some ways a painful process, but a really educational one. This isolation on the cover of the I was something that we wanted to carry into the end papers. Very often, end papers are, are like the overture to a symphony. It, it has to say something about the book without giving the book away. It feels like a modern William Morris, you know, all that ornamentation and nature that would be on his books, you know, around the edges of those like illuminated manuscripts. This is like the 21st century version of that, but instead but of flowers and vines, it's loading signs. Nature was so important to Emerson and the 19th century book design that would have followed him through his prolific years as a published author. And I like that you said William Morris, who of course was a Brit, and this is an American writer. So I think even more, we have a dialogue between centuries and between continents. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> Great, thanks. And I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to hang on a second. Let me do this. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. Sorry. Oh, here we go. Okay. I did it for you. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so before we move on to q and A, I'm going to share my screen briefly so we could do the quick uh, book raffle. So uh, let me. All right, could everyone see my screen? All right, so I'm just going to click here and someone's name is going to be selected. All right, we got uh, Priya. There you go. That's hilarious. Let me stop sharing. Is Priya still here? And I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing mispronouncing your name. All right, cool. All right, they just commented. All right, so we'll be contacting you with a. Uh, to collect your, your information so we could get that book over to you. But with that said, we can now proceed over to the Q&A. If anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand in the reactions and then we'll ask you to unmute yourself and then you could go ahead and ask your question. Um, does anyone have any questions to, anyone want to kick that off? All right, I guess I could, I have a question. Um, so given that you you were looking at so many faces and studying them with such great attention to detail, at any point did it reconfigure your relationship with your own face? And is there anything you could share about that? Yeah, I've had so much plastic surgery in the last year. Can you tell? No, I'm kidding. Um, you know, uh, I, I do find that if I've been in the painting studio all day and I come out and I talk to somebody, I 
all I can see is like the shadow on there. Like I really, it's, I, I, I've gone native, I, I've gone deep. Um, but there's some interesting things uh, that I learned along the way. You know, I, I didn't, I wanted to keep moving because I know we began a few minutes late, but the baby on the cover of the book is half a baby flipped. So it's literally a, dime, it's a, it's completely symmetrical, which is uncomfortable. It's the sort of the uncanny valley. And I was interested in the fact that if things are too perfect, we're uncomfortable. But if things are symmetrical, I mean, across, as I said earlier, across all cultural lines, people are really that, that the standard of beauty, I mean, that's the Brunelleschi dome, right? I mean, geometry is meant to be divine. That's what divine proportion is what the whole history of, of the Renaissance was about. So I think that the fact that that, that has endured in faces is really fascinating. I, I mean, I, it was very hard to write a book um, and, and, and give, give uh, faces that failed to be seen historically as they should have been their due. So we did not keep records of certain communities, certain marginalized communities, uh, the way we have for the majority of the sort of white standard bearing, unfortunately, for too many years world. And so that was also like like scrapbooks, a lot of needle in a haystack that I had to do about trying to find, you know, faces that were maybe, maybe not what we consider to be standards of beauty. Um, and it gets into all kinds of things about why we beautify ourselves and why we use filters on Facebook and Instagram and why we posture and preen and what is narcissism and what is a real proper reflection and and it gets into things about gender and race and value and and it's it's its own kind of systemic problem how we perceive ourselves in each other so uh i don't know that i that answers your question it probably just raises more questions but i i think it is there's an infinite pool to draw upon um and, and uh, i think that sort of takeaway is is just that you think you know and you don't it's a lot of mysteries Thank you. Um, I can read a question from the chat from Natasha. So um, Natasha's question, thank you, was, hi, Jessica, do you think it would have been the same process and results if you hadn't been in isolation due to the pandemic? How is this unique time? Um, how is this unique, unique time could help you focus on the process that you normally might have been doing other things? Um, well, the, I will say that the pandemic, uh, my editor, Tim Hudson, came to me. It was his idea that we republish, that he wanted to republish uh, Emerson because he felt that uh, the value of, of standing on your own two feet and being self-reliant was, was a message that needed to be revisited. And he, one day he, we were talking and he said, um, he referred to it as the self-reliance project. And I said, oh, I can get behind that because I've been thinking a lot about students unmoored from their studios, from their professors, from the all the things they know, from their parents, from the sort of normal course of events. And I thought, you know, what I never learned when I was an art student was how to start, how to go, how to edit myself, how to trust myself, how to trust my voice, how to test my voice. So what if I wrote a series of essays about how to be in the studio, how to actually just not depend on that. You know, we live in a moment where teams and post-it notes and playbooks and rules and consensus and scalability. I taught in the business school at Yale for two years, and all these students cared about was did their idea scale for a new business, for a new product, for a new market. I thought, is that the only metric by which we judge ourselves and each other and the value of what it is we contribute to society? I didn't think that was the only way. I still don't think that's the only way. So what really galvanized me and helped frame those essays was, yes, I was stuck at home. I was away from my children. I was on this fellowship. I was stuck in California, beautiful California with all its light. I couldn't really go outside except with a mask on. And it was scary. I was downtown. It was the first state to be closed by, by Gavin Newsom. And I thought, I have to do something. And I want to do something for someone else. I want to pay it forward. I've been an educator for a long time. I raised two children. What can I, I'm now an elder in our profession. What can I do to help make it a little bit easier? And let's face it, most design school curricula are not going to put Ralph Waldo Emerson on the docket. They're not going to say, read this and go figure out how to be in the studio. So what happens if you take this classic canonical text and tease out the way its value might penetrate 
the discipline of creative practice. And it's not just for designers, it's for people who dance, for people, you, you know, a daily practice is a daily practice. It could be yoga, it could be cooking, it could be writing, it could be walking. But the point is you do it and you repeat it and then you revisit it and then you learn and then you develop patterns and you revisit the patterns and you undo things. And I wrote about things like harvesting your own work, like going back in your sketchbooks and taking a thing, an idea you had and bringing it forward. I think for me, having a studio practice that's not about a team and an office and a deadline, but it's about who I am, the voice I have, and what I think I want to invest in and invent that made me, it saved me. It saved me. And, I, and I, the introduction to this book is about my life. It's about loss. I lost my parents. I lost my husband. I had a really difficult decade. It ended with the pandemic in 2020. And I wrote these essays to save myself and maybe to help some other people. Maybe I won't, but I, I think it's really helpful. Read, reading can set you free. It really can. Thank you. I, I sort of have a follow-up question to the idea of self-reliance. So I haven't read the book yet, um, so I'm kind of coming in a little bit uh, dry. But I had a question about, like, thinking of the essay from from Emerson from so long ago, right? Considering then how the pandemic kind of showed people like the the value of other people instead of just relying on themselves. I was really curious if at any point in your book, or if you just want to talk about it, the relationship between self-reliance and also like this swelling need for for community and um kind of needing other people at the same time while also not you know um not um, relying on them on them so much um do you go over that at all in the book yeah yeah well emerson certainly did right he really he missed his friends he longed for his friends but i think what what certain writers and artists teach us, and I would put Rousseau in this category, I would put Rebecca Solnit in this category, both of them writing about walking. There were many, many writers uh, historically who wrote with, a, who walked with a sketchbook or a notebook and they would sit down, and they would write things. They knew that there were certain solitary activities that they required to stay alive as, as makers, as thinkers, as contributors to the world. Didn't mean they didn't need people and miss their communities. But they, they, there's a way in which you can be and trust and live. You know, it's, it's like when you, when you read a great book and you can't stop thinking about it and you're walking around and you just can't stop thinking about it and you want it to continue. You don't want the book to end. You don't want the movie to end. So it's nice to go to a movie with a friend, but it's nice to watch the movie for you. And I think that I want to say something about the question you asked that I think is maybe behind the question you asked. It's very hard in a year like this to write a book about an old white guy. But he had some stuff to say that deserves to be revisited. And just because it's, it's like the idea that what we do all the time is we reinterpret. I'm reinterpreting those Cushing paintings. I'm trying to be mindful and respectful and humane. You, you reinterpret the lessons you learn from your parents or the Bible or the rules of how to play a game. But I think to be your own person is to stand on your own two feet, is to have your own ideas. And I think we don't privilege that enough. I certainly, when I was a student, was told to really draw, you know, color within the lines. And I think it really, it colored, bad use of the word color, uh, it really impinged upon my process. I was constantly just like wanting to find other ways to do things, right? And that there's got to be a way that we can, that you can play well with others, but still be your own person. And so the, the question of community can't be, I mean, here's a perfect example. The, the person who puts something up on Instagram and it doesn't get likes right away, so they take it down. Well, what if that's your work? Maybe don't put it on Instagram. Maybe put it on the wall in your studio and look at it. I have a friend who's a painter who says for every hour he spends painting, he spends three hours just looking. And I have learned a lot from going on these fellowships in Italy and watching other artists and writers and musicians how they use solitary time. It's not because they're antisocial. It's because they believe in their work. It's a great way to be, to believe in your work, to fall in love with your work. It's incredible. Thank you. Thank you. I know we're out of questions, time, but um, is it fine if we go over a little bit? There are a few more. Okay. Questions. Okay. All right, I will ask the question from Ray, which is, you mentioned that you were uncomfortable with the trajectory of design. Could you elaborate more on your discomfort? 
How much time do we have? <laughs> I don't like the way design has become co-opted by the world. Now, this is a conversation that I have all the time with Ellen Lupton, who was the most democratic, I know you had her here, democratic, like, ambassador for design and the public good. I'm not saying that, that that's not a great thing, and I think she is the greatest ambassador we have. But I've seen design become its own kind of imposter syndrome. I see design be about, I'm going to design something that looks like something I think that person wants, and then they'll pay me money for it. Like, why do people look at annuals to get ideas for their work so they can do work that looks like Michael Bieber designed it? That's not, like, how is that, how is that work? How is that your work? How is that your voice? I, I think I soured on design as it was becoming more popular and populist because I worried, as I said at the beginning of this talk, that it very easily confers false authority on anything. I'm a good enough designer that I can make something look more expensive for no reason. Right? Like I can make people spend more money for something great for the client, great for the market, not so great for the consumer. How is that a good thing to be in the world? Right? How does design, and I know there are people that, that are doing design in communities, listening in a different way, challenging the canon in a different way, opening up the conversation in a different way. And I applaud that. But I think uh, my last teaching job was teaching in a business school, and all of these young capitalistic kids wanted to be creative, and they wanted to use the jargon and read Wired and copy things and get a website on Canva. And I just like just felt so empty to me. It's so easy to make stuff look good. Is that all it is? I don't think it is. And you wouldn't all be here if if that's what you did. You're probably all doing amazing work. And I wish we could had time to turn the tables and I could hear you all tell me about your work. But I, I for me, because I'm old, I've been doing this a long time, it ceased to be gratifying to me. I was having clients mansplaining my career to me. I was watching, I mean, to, to one to on one on one level, I think social media for me has been a real thrown real damper in my enthusiasm about design as a set of original ways of working. I think the fact that everybody writes in the same typeface on email and Facebook looks the same and Instagram looks the same and and the, the real estate we have for social media is unlimited. I started to really question the value of my time spent doing that. I'd rather live more um, simply and do work I can stand behind than just do work that looks cool like a personal but also ethical like broader ethical concern about yeah how are you gotta using ask, media? gotta ask the ethical questions i've said this before so forgive me if you've heard me say this but i wrote invention of desire after i was on a jury in amsterdam and the big award was going to a student who had taken a um a photograph of a bunch of uh terrorists in flak jackets with rifles with uh, arabic type at the bottom and because he was a really good coder he stripped out the bubble letters in Arabic and he wanted to create a kind of a Mad Libs Kickstarter where you could fund, start your own revolution by creating this thing. And he was populating his Kickstarter brilliant little app that he was making with pictures of terrorists. And I, I went batshit crazy. I just said, we cannot give this a, an award. And everybody else said, why? This is like 2008. I mean, it was early 2009. And everybody else said, why it's so inventive. This is like a designer coding and reverse engineering a message. And I said, because we can't encourage students to make things that leave their desktop and travel in the unprecedented vulnerable world of the interwebs and land somewhere else where it's interpreted in some other way. It just seemed to me pernicious and impractical and irresponsible and morally reprehensible. And I was not very popular because I shut down the jury for three hours and he didn't get the award. And I think after that, everything was different for me because I thought we can't keep rewarding, awarding people for being cool. Innovation cannot just be about cool. Yet that is irresponsible. Mm -hmm. It's really fun Thank to be you. old. The filters come off I being old. This. I want to tell you. <laughs> filters come off. I'm not afraid to say shit. Yeah. Wait right here in Providence. There's an interview that you did recently that I was listening to, and you mentioned something similar where someone was getting an award for designing packaging for uh, unhealthy, yeah. unhealthy food. Yes. 
And uh, that thing got that, that was talk about filters coming up. That was in London. I thought no one was going to listen to it. It was downloaded 150,000 times. The most it's that I'll never be viral like that again. And I was it was probably career suicide. But yes, it was someone who I will not name because I'm a good little girl who went to Quaker school. But it was someone who makes a shitload of money and uh, yeah, is, is basically was asked how he was, was resilient. He and his team were resilient during the pandemic. And he talked about this big brand company that he works for and how they introduced this junk food. And I thought, you know, he's like the Monsanto of junk food, this guy. And he get, gets paid a lot of money and he, people revere him. How is that design? How is that what we were put on this planet to do as graphic designers? I, I can't stand behind that anymore. It may make me very unpopular, but um, I can't do it. Yeah, I really appreciate you being so bold about that, about it. And, and yeah, I just feel like there's a lot of designers that agree with you, but are probably afraid to, to, say, to say that publicly because it could be misinterpreted or someone could take it the wrong way, especially in today's age where everything is about, you know, money. Um, and there, there, so there's another question in the chat uh, from Leslie. She says, thank you for this talk, Jessica. Has working in painting and fine art shifted your perception of your relationship with your audience compared with design? Yes, I think, I think both of them are asynchronous. I remember being an editorial designer years ago and I was designing a Sunday magazine and I was on the train on a weekend and I saw somebody leafing through the paper and going through my magazine. And I was like, I'm watching my audience. And this guy like went through it and threw it on the ground, right? And I thought, I spent four days designing that layout. And it was very humbling to me. I, obviously with painting, it's the same thing. I, you, in, I can't be in the gallery when the work is being shown. I, I'm just starting to show. I'm just starting to think about how to show, where to show. I'm a kind of baby artist in that way. I have a lot of work. I've been really prolific in the last two years because, you know, I stopped teaching and the world shut down. And I had a lot of time to paint. But... Um, I think for me, maybe this is another way, Leslie, to answer your question. I, I don't imagine that the goal here is to have a one woman show at MoMA. I think the goal here is to have conversations like the one we're having right now. For me, I always was a teacher, writer, designer. Now I'm a teacher, writer, painter, you know, recovering designer. But I want to have these conversations. I want to show these paintings and contextualize the work I'm doing for audiences, not because I'm, of course, I'd love to have a gallery and sell my paintings, but I'm interested in the provocation of making something and putting it out in the world and thinking about how we think about things differently as a result. That's what a good book does. That's what a good, good painting does. That's what a good piece of design does. It makes you think and you come away not wanting to copy it or not being a better person, maybe being a sadder person or a more conflicted person but you go deeper as a result of the provocation. And that to me, for, for me right now, I'm at, at an age where I'm older and I have something to say and I'm teaching myself how to say it in a different way. I don't think I could have done this 20 years ago, but I also don't imagine that I'm gonna suddenly start wearing a beret and go to Paris and walk around selling my paintings. I think it's all you know, a buildup. It's all sort of a collective enterprise. My practice is a lot of different things and, I, and I'll always teach and I'll always write. And I hope I'll always paint. All right, so we got, I think we get, we have time for just one more question that we could wrap up. Uh, Lauren, do you wanna go? Okay, I can ask my question. Um, I really appreciate your openness about this, your whole process and just, um, especially your questioning yourself throughout the process and questioning your work. I had a professor once that told us that all ideas are worth having, even if only to decide against them. Um, and sometimes that went to extremes, but it was good. And I can see that spirit in your paintings where you're grappling with like the ethics of like what you're doing in the paintings of like the medical images of, of actual people or mixing facial features from various like racial and cultural backgrounds. And I'm curious how it feels to talk about um, to talk about this in hindsight. Like, do you feel differently now in hindsight about the questions you were having than you did in the moment? No, I feel even more emboldened to have them. I mean, there's a couple of things I will say. I will say that like during the pandemic, there are moments when I was lonely. I am never lonely in the studio. That more than anything is why you need to read this book. Like you learn how to, learning how to be in the studio 
it's it's life it's a life saving practice it's you because you learn about it's like therapy you learn about yourself what are you asking what are you thinking about what makes you tick and how do you best find form to go with that set of investigations and it might change over time and for me I started this talk tonight talking about writing. I ended it talking about writing. In between there was painting, graphic design, and its ethical conundrum continues to actually plague me from time to time. I, I love talking to groups of people like all of you tonight, but I think the questions keep coming. It's not about the answers, it's about the questions. It's like one of those things like, you know, it's the journey, not the destination. You have to finish. You know, we know you have to have a beginning and a middle and an end to a story. But I think for me, I, I want to have the conversations, and I, and I think the way to have them is to open up the pool of questions and also where you have the conversation. And you change the conversation by where you have it. If this year has taught us anything, it's taught us that. We hear about challenging the canon. We hear about marginalized voices. Well, why wouldn't we want to think about better ways to do that and to stop doing what we used to do? What does it mean to think about things like the? I've been thinking about this a lot today. My burning question I'll leave you with tonight. What happens when you spend your whole life as a designer engaged in the pursuit of excellence and you're told that the pursuit of excellence is not inclusive? Right? Excellence for whom? Award winning by whom? Who decides who wins? Is that really what it's all about? Is it the person who gets the shiniest? Trophy? Is it the person who makes the most expensive car? Is it Elon Musk? We all want to be Elon Musk. I don't think that's going to end well, right? So I'm not saying we don't have to make money. I'm not saying that capitalism doesn't have an incredible role to play in the art world and the design world. But I think we have to get ruthlessly objective with ourselves and each other. I think education has to change. I think what we read has to change. I think the vocabulary has to change. The word, I, the question earlier about what, what, why do you have this antipathy about design? What does the word design mean? You look it up in dictionary, the etymology is fascinating. Like to have designs on someone is sinister, right? Design is a verb, it's a noun, it's decorative, it's operational. We don't own it, we need to own it. Or we need to question it before other people question it for us. Because I think, talk about getting marginalized, design will become marginalized as a profession if we don't ask deeper, better questions. Um, Kali, I think I didn't say this name wrong, but Kali Lassen uh, always said that design is having an identity crisis. And I, I feel like that is kind of in the vein of what you're talking about, is that we need to kind of grapple with our identity as designers. I'm glad you brought up Kali Lassen because we just lost Ken Garland, who was another like really sort of staunch spokesperson on behalf of, you know, first things first, what really matters? Commerce is real. Right, we have bills to pay, but I think design uh, has to actually think a lot more about its role in a society that's not just about it being a panacea or a pastiche or surface. That's that's I think the concern, and I think in a year in which we live on screens, it's very easy to just you know do that. We can't do that. We have to engage. It's hard. Thank you. Thank you. It's so hard. Much. When, it's hard when I'm <laughs> suggesting. I, I'm not yeah. saying this is easy, but nothing no, nothing that's worthwhile isn't. And um, yes. I, I just think we're all, you're all passionate people about the work that you do. So, you know, show up and do it and, and the world will thank you. I will, I will thank you. Well, we thank you <laughs> because this has been very- been my great pleasure. This has been great. And I hope and believe it will continue as a conversation on Slack all night long. So thank you so much. Oh, I hope so. Send me the recording. We'll share it. We'll share whatever we can on Design Observer. Um, thank you for Priya for getting the book. I will write you a lovely little note. And um, I hope next time I see you all, it's live under the Anish Kapoor thing in that park that I love in Chicago. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jessica, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It was a blast. Uh, we did record this, so we'll be publishing a YouTube link shortly, and, uh, and we'll share with you, Jessica, and we'll put it on our social as well. So thank Lovely. you. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks, everybody. Good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.